Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Simplify Your Life Summit. I'm your host, Justin Crosscarry, and I am joined by Mr. Cornell Thomas. Cornell, thank you for being on here, man. I appreciate it. It's an honor. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Cornell is an author and an expert in positive self-awareness, which is something that's not talked about, you know, a lot. And I'd love to just jump right into that. What exactly is not just self-awareness, but positive self-awareness? And tell us a little bit about how you, uh, you coach into that. Yeah. So for me, there are so many people on the planet that are not self-aware that because we're in the rat race of, we were just talking about before we started, like kids and family and work, et cetera, we don't put enough time on ourselves to realize like, okay, what's going on with me? And I think since we've been like younger, as soon as we get into the school system, it's kind of we're indoctrinated with these ideals that they're like limitations and you have to maybe look a certain way or be a certain way. You turn on the TV, you're like, oh, none of these cool people look like me. Like none of the people I'll say by the bell look like me. So what is that? So, so what does that make me? Right. So a positive self-awareness from in my de- definition is all just getting back to yourself and being very conscious of what you tell yourself every single day. You can't control, you have hundreds of thousands of thoughts a week. You can't control those th- all those thoughts, but you, what you tell yourself, what you feed yourself is what um, I focus on when I talk to people about it. Mm, I love that. And that's so crucial, right? I've, I've heard uh, someone say, if you wouldn't say it to someone else, don't say it to yourself because we're always mm. our, our hardest critic, right? And yeah. um, it's tough because it's so easy to be, to. I, I, it must just be a natural thing to be kind of critical on ourselves, you know, because we do see, um, you know, better for ourselves. What are some simple ways that you've found that really help people reframe that and, and get to that positive light if they are in that self feed up, especially over years, you know? Yeah. Well, I think it's, you have to look at it like this. If you had a a Picasso in your house, right? You had a Picasso in your house. You wouldn't let anybody breathe on it. You'd have it wrapped up and like in a safe somewhere. You wouldn't let anybody, you barely let someone look at it. You would treat it like it is, you know, the best thing on earth because you know how valuable it is. And I tell people, I'm like, you're that Picasso. And this Mm -hmm. is what we don't understand. And people say it now all the time, but you know, to be the chances of being born or the odds of being born, is like one in 400, whatever, million, trillion, whatever the case may be. Now, if you think about that, those are like the chances, way beyond the chances of ever having a Picasso, right? Like one in 400 trillion is like meeting Picasso and like having him painted in your house for you. Yeah. So if that's being said, then you, you have to understand there's something special about you. That doesn't mean you're going to have a special life. That all depends on the work you put in and your self-belief and faith and all that other stuff. But there's something special about you being created. We just don't want to dive down deep into figuring out, well, what's our mission? We get caught up in this rat race and we're just like, okay, well, I'm just going to consume and then die eventually. And then that, whatever happens, that's that happens. Well, I did a TED Talk last year about, you know, purpose. And if you realize that you're the miracle, if you realize you're that one in 400 trillion chance, or whatever it is, then you're going to carry yourself different and you're going to start asking questions. Like I was very curious about, well, why am I here? You know, after I finished playing basketball, I'm like, okay, now what? Like now what's the next step? And because yeah. I'm searching it, something, eventually it, it showed itself. So for someone that's maybe struggling to find that purpose or find something, is there a certain exercise that you do every day, whether it be, you know, um, you know, something that I've done is look myself in the mirror and, and tell myself I love myself, which was super yeah. weird for a long time. Yeah. But once you actually like absorbed it and once I started to absorb it and actually feel it, it's an incredible feeling because we don't always say that, you know, we're always looking in the mirror and like, Oh, my hair looks this way or, Oh, I don't, you know, what are some simple ways that, that you that. work with? Yeah. I love that you said that because that's what I do with some of my clients that, that when I first have them, depending on what level they are in terms of like confidence and self-belief, I'm like, just 30 seconds, look in the mirror. Don't say anything. Just 30 seconds, look in the mirror and then tell me what thoughts came in your mind. And it's mm. all the stuff that you just said. Oh my gosh, I have bags under my eyes. I can't believe I'm so tired. Man, why am I doing this? Blah, blah. All these thoughts are coming to your mind. Then you write them down. And you're like, okay, well, why are these thoughts coming to my mind? Because it's a reflection of you, right? It's how you feel about yourself. For me, there's five things that I say every single day. Um, uh, I have like a, a little checklist that I start. I don't know why. I was like shoveling snow. And uh, it was like years ago. And I just started coming up with these things like, um, you know, um, I never let doubt stop my due. You know, my my faith in God will 
over, override any obstacle that comes across my path, you know? Um, like things like that, and, you know, the darkest days, you know, I'll find light. Like just little things that started coming up to, in my mind, I just started saying them. So every day I wake up and I will accomplish everything I set out to do. My faith in you will, and I just start, I reel them off. And I just say it mm-hmm. once, but there's times I feel like when I'm having a rough day, those five things come into my head, right? So it's, it's not always, it doesn't have to be the verbal, right? Sometimes you're just thinking it and planting the seed. So I tell people, one, that mirror check is big. That's important. Two, positive, self, uh, positive affirmations. It might sound, it seem corny. Like, I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't. But it's, it's science. It's proven, right? Like, what you tell yourself is going to affect how your body is. Like, the reason that you go to the gym, you feel great when you come out of the gym, those endorphins are pumping because now you're like, oh, I worked out today. All right, cool. Like, I feel, you know, I feel good. It's the same thing. It's just doing a mental workout. You know, this is your strongest muscle. And I think if we understand that, then we can start working towards being more positive and believing in ourselves. Mm, totally. And I love how you said muscle because a lot of people, you know, even myself included, I just thought it was like a really quick thing to fix, but it's not. It's just like going to the gym. It's just like practicing basketball, right? You didn't yeah. get good after one shot. So no. um, going into that, I would love for you to speak into, you know, your story and adversity because that is a, a big builder when it comes to confidence and when it comes to, you know, sure. you know, your mental mindset as well. So I'd love for you to share about, yeah. about that. Well, I would say my story, when I go and speak, I tell people my story started when I was four years old. When I was four years old, my father passed. He was a police officer in uh, Passaic, New Jersey. Did all these things in the community. Uh, Bobby Thomas. I mean, just they named the street after him eight years ago. Like just a big, big time guy. I, I never knew him. Right. So when my father passed. My mom had to raise five of us by herself. And one of my brothers is autistic and we had no money. So who I am in terms of like being a solution-based person is solely based on who my mother was. I I never saw her quit because quitting meant us not surviving. So I was raised by this like five foot two, like lioness that would not, would not accept our circumstances and our circumstances at times for sure were dire and she just wouldn't accept them. So all through my elementary school, middle school, there was nothing I was uh, passionate about because I didn't, most young, guy, young men want to be like their fathers. And I didn't know my dad. And all I saw was my mom working three jobs every single day. So I didn't want to do any of those things. It just seemed like she was tired all the time. And then when I was a sophomore in high school, the summer of my sophomore year in high school, I was sitting in Birdsmouth, Virginia, where my mom is from, which is as big as my room right now. And... I looked under my cousin's bed and he had all these newspaper articles and he was on the front cover of one of them dunking a basketball. Mm. And I had no idea that they put like kids in the newspaper. So I'm like, my cousin's famous. This is, he's a couple of years old. And I was like, this is amazing. And I looked on his wall and he had all these articles and I read every article. And that day I said, I'm going to be a basketball player. Never picked up a ball before in my life. I was 16, got home, walked to a court, the nearest court had this little Pizza Hut basketball back when Pizza Hut used to be the, you know, that was the, they had money to give away basketballs. <laughs> and I, I, I looked at the basket and I threw the ball up and the ball went over the basket, rolled down the hill. And I did that for two more hours. And I said, oh, wow, I suck at basketball. And there was a guy that came out, uh, came to the court and his name was Ray. And he said, you want me to show you how to shoot a basketball? And Ray, if it wasn't for Ray, I wouldn't be here right now. He changed the course of my life because even though I only saw him three times, he planted this seed that if you work hard, you can get better. And I had my work ethic for my mom. So I figured that if I put six, seven hours a day, eventually I can get better. And it was like typical sports story. I got cut from varsity my junior year, played sat JV, then my senior year never played. Then after my senior year, my mom told me uh, for the first time ever, I've heard her say can't. She said, I can't afford to send you to college. And I told her, I said, I'm going to work two jobs. I'm going to go to a two-year college. I'm going to get a full scholarship. And then I'm going to go to, a, you know, get a contract to play professional basketball. And then you never have to work again. And so I worked two jobs, went to a two-year college. By like my second year, which was four years of me playing basketball, I things started to take off. I got a scholarship to play in North Dakota. Came back home. I'm working out with NBA guys. I get a contract to play in Europe. A week before I'm supposed to go, I rope to my Achilles tendon. Mm. so that like i mean my whole my say basketball is everything there was no plan b c d e my plan a was basketball and that was it and the reason i wanted to play basketball professionally is because 
I want to make sure my mom never had to work again. So I had this strong purpose, a strong why. And when I ruptured my Achilles, I remember sitting in the room right after my surgery and thinking to myself, like, why would this happen to me? You know, um, I, do, I don't drink. I don't smoke. It was a pure, it's pure purpose. It's like for my mom. It's not even for me. I don't care about any of the fame or any of that stuff. Why would God allow this injury to happen right now? And they said that when you go, when you're going through some type of drastic change, it's almost like when you hear about you having, you having a terminal illness, there's like five stages. There's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then acceptance. I went through all those stages within like 30, 45 minutes. And then I called my best friend up at the time, my friend Kevin, I said, pick me up Monday. We're going to the gym. He said, what are you, what are we going to do at the gym? Like I said, just pick me up. And I shot from a chair for six months. Then I shot from a crutch for the next three. And I worked my way back and I was able, and my old coach was now the athletic director at the school that I used to coach at. I used to play at my two-year school. He asked me if I, if I coach basketball, I was 25. He's like, our coach just left. Would you coach this team? I was like, hell no. I was like, I'm 25 years old. What are you talking about? Like, I'm not, some of these guys, junior college, some of these guys are 23. You know, I'm not going to coach this guys. And uh, I went on the interview, didn't want it. My mom said I should go on the interview out of respect for my coach. Next thing I know, I'm coaching basketball. I'm coaching basketball for six years. I go to this national powerhouse, Blair Academy, as an assistant. They have NBA players, Division One guys all over the place. I started coaching there. And then two years before my son was born, I started to get this shift. Like, it's not basketball. And that's where I think a lot of people just, like, they run the other way because it's scary when your identity is wrapped up in something. And my identity was wrapped up in a ball. Like, no one knew me for anything but basketball. So basketball is the first time that I became cool. Like, I was like, okay, he's Cornell the basketball player. And it took years for me to be Cornell the cool basketball player. First, I was like, here's Cornell the crappy basketball player. So <laughs> when, you, when you take that identity away, then the mask gets taken. That's why the positive self, self-awareness is like, who am I now? Mm. So I didn't know what it was. And I was on Facebook one day, just randomly going through my timeline. And it was super negative. And a friend of mine got me a book of positive quotes. And I, used, I was taking the quotes out of the book for whatever reason. I have no idea to this day what made me do it. I started taking the quotes out of the book and putting them on Facebook. People start to like it. And then one day I woke up and I couldn't find the book. And I wrote my own quote. People still liked it. So I was like, well, screw the book. I'm just going to make my own quote. So I started writing my own quotes. And then six months went by. My friend Stephanie was like, where do you get your quotes from? I was like, I just make them up. She goes, you should write a blog. I said, what the hell is a blog? And so we sat in like Panera Bread and she made a WordPress site and I wrote my first blog. And after about six months, I said, I'm going to write a book. She said, how are you going to write a book? I said, I'm just going to Google it. <laughs> and I Googled it and wrote my first book. And it's called The Power of Positivity Controlling Where the Ball Bounces. And then as soon as the book came out, I said, well, I want to speak. I didn't go to anybody's you know, speaking course or any of that stuff. I just felt like I had a story that I needed to tell. So I was speaking everywhere. Five people, two people, one person, didn't matter. Um, and in the first eight months, I did it for not, I'm free. I didn't get one cent for eight months, nine months. Uh, and then I still have my bag. I have a check for $100 the first time I was ever yeah, ever got paid. Uh, and I said, I needed to cash at that time. I never cashed it just because I was saying to myself, when this has more zeros at the end of it, I won't, never want to forget where I came from. Mm-hmm. And so then I started coaching in 2015. I spoke in England for the first time. And then it just started going. Like I just got back from Africa and Dubai and all these different places. And people were like, they're, they're waiting for some crazy story about how I became a speaker. Like I was walking in the woods and all of a sudden the woods opened up and a voice came down from the heavens or something like, or something like that. Like, no, I was like, I just was sick of seeing negative nonsense on social media. And I just happened to have a book of positive quotes. And I feel like I was created. My mission is to do what I'm doing right now. Like I got steered this way for a reason. I wasn't supposed to play basketball. I wasn't supposed to be this big time coach. And I think when you, look at adversity that way like where is it steering me towards Mm, it's a little bit different you know if you look at it as oh my god the world is ending there's nothing i can do then you're right you know um uh, kurt vonnegut says you are we are whatever we pretend to be you Mm. can pretend to be the victim or you can do something about it right it's i mean there's there's really only two alternatives so that's because of my mom because of the great tina thomas i literally look at solutions for i don't even the problem is so small to me where i'm like it's not a real problem though like what's the solution 
So that's my mindset going through stuff. And that's when I share my, like when I share my story, it doesn't matter where I go. I just came back from Jeddah, came back from all these, it doesn't matter. People, people can relate to adversity because we all go through it. And it doesn't matter what God you pray to, who you voted for, what color you are, right? We all go through it. It's different levels of adversity, but you can tell me a story about your life where you've gone through something and I can completely relate to it. Totally. That's the, the human experience and the human connection. You know, when you build that, when you, when you um, connect with that. I think one of the coolest things about just listening, you, listening to you speak about your story is um, an incredible intuitiveness with where you were going and just trust and not taking too much time to um, assess the situation. You said you went through those five phases in about 45 minutes. Some people go throughout their whole life doing that. What were some ways that you were able to, or maybe, you know, I know you mentioned your mother was a big influence on you, but what, what are some ways that uh, you're able to work through things and just trust that the next step is going to be there? Yeah. Well, the first thing I did, which, you know, you hear these gurus and these people that, you know, actually they know every answer is they, they almost guilt you from, for being human. Like I let stuff out. Like I was in my room crying, you Mm -hmm. know, like, in my room angry pissed and it's like if you listen to some of these cats that are talking it's like they don't want you to be human and that's Mm -hmm. why i think like motivational speakers or people of that field sometimes get like a bad rap because it's like they get down like what do you mean suck it up man not everybody's you bro like you don't know what people are going through you know this thing up here is a freaking haunted house if you want it to be this can be a haunted house. And it's like, if you have no one to turn the lights on or you don't have the teaching or training to turn the lights on, you can live in there. Like you said, you can live in there forever, right? So I let it all out. It might've been 45 minutes, but man, it was a destructive 45 minutes of me crying and being angry and being pissed. But I always look always on the other side of it because I think to myself, what's one, what's the alternative? And two, how much time are you going to waste? Like I'm very um in tune with you know how fragile human life is like i'm very in tune with how little time we have right and i do this thing where i tell people that's a little morbid but i'm like if you put a hundred marbles in a jar and take out your age and that's if everything goes a hundred like fantastic if everything goes well that's how much time you have left and it's as simple as that the question is how much time do you want to waste How much time do you want to stay fixated on the problem? Because those marbles, they're gone regardless. It doesn't matter what you do, right? The marbles, are they're they're going to be out of that jar, right? So how much time are you wasting? So for me, I always look at it and I'm like, the first thing I ask myself is, is this life or death? It's the first thing. Is my life in danger? Is it life or death? 99.9% of the time, it's no, right? 99.9. The second thing I ask myself, what are the steps that you need to do right now, right? So if I get laid off from my job, right, the immediate steps might not be, oh, you know, go to the newspaper, look on the internet. But the immediate steps might be like, you have to tell your wife or you have to tell, you know, someone close to you, get a support system, accountability partner, right? It could be, all right, go through my resources and see who I can talk to right away. Like, it could be talk to my landlord because I'm not going to be able to pay rent for this next month, right? And then I just go through this process. Okay, well, what's the next step and the next step? And you like if you look at this a big glacier and you have this little ice pick and you're just like chipping away at the problem until you get to the solution. It's not – sometimes it comes quick and sometimes it goes – like for basketball, me being hurt, it wasn't me coming up with, oh, I'm going to be a coach. That just happened, right? That just happened. I wasn't like – I can't take credit for that. You know, like it, I came and I said, okay, well, I don't want to do it. Next thing you know, I did it. But there's some problems that you just have to kind of like chip away at until you start finding the solution. And it's always, for me, it's always steps, right? It's always steps. But that first question is the most important. Is it life or death? No. Okay. What's the next thing I have to do? What's the next thing after that? And when I break that down to people, there might be 15 steps in one problem that they have to do. There might be two steps right? Like someone broke up with me. Is it life or death? No. What's the next step? All right. We got to start blocking numbers. We got to start, like we start (laughs) distancing ourselves, right? Like give the varsity 
jacket back, like give back the mixtape. You know, like there's things that you got to do <laughs> to kind of like get it out of your system and then go from there, right? So I think it's just when you put things in steps and you break it down in little increments, uh, incremental steps, I think it makes the problem a little bit easier. It doesn't make it so mass. Yeah, um, that's so powerful because I, I know for myself, there's been times where, um, you know, something I talk about, I think in the, uh, my, my video, or I think it's my email for this whole summit is, um, life can quickly compound, right? And if mm. we take too much time looking at that iceberg, that iceberg will continue to get big. But if right. we just focus on chipping away, you know, incrementally, that's what I heard you say is action is more important than the plan. Because if you're taking that action, the plan will work its way out. And that's what you've done. Yeah. And, and it things just happen. Like you've said uh, multiple times on this conversation, I don't know where this these voices came from. I don't know where these quotes came from. Like you were just taking action. And when you're doing that, you're building that mental strength. You're building that confidence rather than looking at it. You know, it's a psychological assessment versus um, taking action. So yeah. in your book, you talk about um, the separation between good and great. What would you say are some simple things that do separate people from just being good average to, to great? Yeah. The first is why you're doing it right? Mm. Like why you're doing it. Like for me, I'm willing, literally willing to die for what I do right now. Like my purpose, you know? So if I'm like, I, so the TED talk I did last year, the day before, a lot of people don't know. I just made a post of it a couple of days ago. I was in the hospital, right? No one knew. No one knew outside of my family. No one knew I was in the hospital. I went on that TED, I talked to the doctor. I said, can I run a marathon if I want to run a marathon tomorrow? The doctor said, yeah, you'd be okay. I said, okay, cool. I'm going to do the TED Talk. My wife knows I'm a crazy person. She knew I was doing the talk regardless. I'd do it in a freaking gurney. didn't matter, right? Because my, the message is so, is so important. So I'd say, one, it's like, why are you doing it? Like, what are you willing to give to this, right? Two, I have a, such a strong faith. You know, like for me, like my relationship with God and just the belief that I was created to do this. Like when you have that faith in yourself or faith in something higher than you or bigger than you, and you feel like, okay, this is my mission. It's hard to put limits on that. Right. Because like, Mm -hmm. I look at it, like, it's really hard for me to put limits on God. Like there's no limits there. Right. So I, and I I just have a strong faith system in God where it's like, okay, this is why I was created. Um, I think another thing also for me is that, once you're doing something that you love, like you're doing what you're supposed to do, you start getting these breadcrumbs, right? The people, mm. opportunities, phone calls. You're like, how is this? Like, Justin, like us talking right now, how? Right? If you really sit and think about it, right? How? Well, here we are having this interview. Here you are, and I'm part of this like amazing thing that you're doing, right? How? Right? I'm a, from New Jersey. Like, it just, it happens. Right. So when you're in it, when you're in that zone of life where it's like, I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, things start to happen. You hear people say all the time, oh, that guy's lucky or that girl's lucky. Or they could be doing exactly what they're supposed to do. So things are starting to open up. If I was an accountant right now, nothing would open up for me because I'd be miserable hating life. Nothing against accountants. It's just, it wouldn't be for me. Right. Sitting in a cubicle, I couldn't do it. So, I think when you're in your zone, when you're in that, like, that, that, like, flow where, man, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, I think the opportunities just start going 10x. Like, you just start getting opportunities all over the place. And that's where that self-awareness is so important, right? Because if you have that self-awareness, that's when you're listening to yourself for, you know, i.e., if you were an accountant, like, I, my accounting classes were not good. I barely pulled that through <laughs> in college, so... Um, I knew that pretty quickly, but I also like trust myself. And there has been times where I'm like, this is scary, you know, but I know I'm feeling drawn in that way. And, and I'm listening to, you know, myself and having that self-awareness. And um, I got the goosebumps when you're talking about the the breadcrumbs, because, mm-hmm. you know, right now that's the, the stage I'm in is I'm just following. I'm just going and not worrying how, but mainly where I'm going and mm-hmm. little things like, for example, connecting with you, you know. Um, So it's awesome to see that you have your positivity summit coming up and um, you know, I would love for you to share what that's about, how people can tune in if if you're doing that virtually, or I think you're doing a tour as well. So I'd love for you to chat about that. Yeah. um, 
and I'm going to say this without like, you know, this is nothing against how anybody run, runs events because I think events, even if, if they're, especially they're coming from a positive place, I think there's a play, like there's a something for everybody. For me personally, the, the issue that I had with events that I was seeing is that they were more like a rah-rah pump up, you know, like let's make this a party type event. Mm-hmm. And people would leave there and they would be like, well, I, I had fun. Like, okay, I just saw whatever musician that came to the event and performed or this celebrity that came and talked about having money, right? But I didn't get anything for myself. So they come back and it becomes like they're addicted to like, you know, drugs. They keep coming back and coming back and they're not getting anything. So I said to myself, I said, what's the biggest problem I have with events? I said, that's one. The price tag is the second thing. If I'm saying, man, I want to change the world, but my ticket's, you know, $3,000, you're alienating like 98% of the world. So I'm like, all right, I want to do an event where it's just not me speaking. It's speakers from all different races, backgrounds, dialects, whatever. Um, and we're doing a day of people just sharing their stories, just like we're doing at your, your event right here. It's like you're sharing your stories and there is no takeaway because it could, it's like reading a poem. You might get something completely different out of the poem than I do, right? But in that story, there'll be the lessons that you can you know, hopefully apply to your life or et cetera. So I want to do you know, stories. Everybody's 25, 30 minutes. No one's selling from stage. Everybody's just sharing their story. Then we have like a couple workshops. So we have a day of self-development, a day for you. And then we have a day of giving back, a day of outreach, right? And that could be anything. That could be uh, helping the homeless. That could be going to coffee shops and giving 20 bucks to the barista and saying, take care of the next couple of coffees. It could be anything. So we've done one in New Jersey, New York, um, LA, and London. And the next one's in mm-hmm. Dubai in September. And then one in New York in October. And then hopefully Switzerland in November. And I'm doing this myself. Like I have one person on my team. And she's from England, Lisa Skipton. She's the only, but like her and my brother Rob, you know, they're like the only two people that are on my team. And we've done four of these. And it's like, you know, trying to get sponsors and trying to, people always ask me like on your, on your, um, on your um, form, it was like, you know, what's your assistant? And I feel like joking around, I want to put my name again. Like just, oh, it's me. <laughs> like, like I do, like I do everything like for right now, you. And, you know, and you get it. So it's like, we have to do that until we build it to the point where we can delegate and whatever. But the positivity summit is another thing. It's like, I do that for adults, but I'm also going to do that for in the high schools because the mm. kids need it. Yeah. So I'm doing totally. something for the high schools where they can bring things back to their schools, bring some to change the culture of their schools where they're not worried about their label and they're being bigger than their label. Like there's so much stuff that I want to do with it. There's a TV show that we shot the pilot, you know, like a trailer for that's going to come out called on purpose. That's about, what I do right now, me traveling all over the world and interviewing like non-celebrity type people that are doing great things for humanity, you know? Mm. So there's like all this stuff that I have in the works that I just need to keep like making it happen. Yeah. 100%. So where, if someone's looking to check out this summit, see if it's coming to a city near them, we need to get San Diego on the map. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. uh, (laughs) How does someone, is there a website? How would would someone find that? Sure. So um, my website is www.cornell-thomas.com. And then all through social media, it's at Cornell Thomas. Um, Instagram's Cornell Thomas 34, but everything else, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, everything. And I always tell people, I said, hit me up, message me. I will message you right back. Um, I pride myself in being able to connect with people as much as possible. So people sometimes get surprised with a message me and like next day we were on a phone, we're on a phone call. I got a conversation with a lady from San Diego today. Um, and she's like, I can't believe we're talking on the phone. I'm like, well, this is what, this is what humans are supposed to do. We're supposed to connect and have conversation, <laughs> right. you know? So I, I mean it, you hit me up, I'm hitting you right back. Yeah. I mean, Hey, we just met, uh, not too long ago. So Here we go. it happens quick. <laughs> yeah. You're man of yeah. your word. So I appreciate yeah. it. And then last thing, I know you have a free gift for all the listeners. Yes. And, uh, so I'd love for you to chat about that. Yeah. So our, my free gift is, is, uh, two things. One, I have a. Uh, our, my book, Extraordinary, uh, This Between Good and Great, uh, it was endorsed by Tony Robbins a year and a half ago. Uh, I have that book and I have a Positivity Summit t-shirt uh, that I want to give to your listeners so they can rock it wherever they go. So you right get on. a book and a t-shirt. I will deliver it to you. 
Um, all you have to do is uh, the email is cornellthomas365 at gmail.com. And uh, so hit me up and uh, whoever wins that, I got you. Perfect. I love it. And uh, I'll put that on there as well. Um, so everyone can see it. Well, thank you so much, Cornell. I appreciate the time and, uh, the knowledge in your story is amazing. You're a phenomenal storyteller as well. So, um, again, appreciate it. Thank you so much and looking forward to hearing the responses with this. Yeah.